gate, and the great traitors followed the black headsman on their last walk to Tower Hill. It's odd now that at lunchtime one can hear a bunch of orators fiercely attacking Parliament and the government without fear for their necks. Crowds that gathered 300 years ago to shout death to the king's enemies now laugh and cheer while one patient London bobby keeps the... London was never frightened by its police. It thought they were wonderful and gave them pet names. Flatties, coppers, bobbies, blue bottles, peelers. Peelers, of course. Sir Robert Peel created them in their respectable uniforms to protect property from the London mobs in the hungry 1820s. But the river police came first, but perhaps their ghosts still watch the night guard to the Bank of England. In the Gordon Riots of 1780, a mob led by a brewer's drayman on a shire horse attacked the Bank of England. Every night since then, a picket of the guards with their officer has marched down to the city to protect the bank. I suppose it guards the gold. There's any gold left to guard. Nothing ever happens now, but the picket officer is still given his traditional bottle of wine to keep his courage up, just in case. Of course, the pensioners at Chelsea have a drink in them too. A free pint of beer every day, and an extra pint to toast Oak Apple Day, Charlie's Day. Charles II founded the Royal Chelsea Hospital and sent his old soldiers to live in the riverside building that Wren designed for them. Every year, the pensioners parade on Oak Apple Day to celebrate the King's escape from Cromwell's Roundheads when he hid in an oak tree at Boscobel Wood. The old soldiers put oak leaves round the King's statue and drink their beer. And their backs are straight once more as the governor calls for three cheers for our pious founder, Charles II. Kings of England do not forget their navy. So William and Mary founded the Royal Hospital at Greenwich for sailors. Wren's greatest achievement after St. Paul's and the loveliest building on Thames side. Today it is the Royal Naval College and the officers dine in the painted hall. Sir James Thornhill spent 20 years painting it. Poor Thornhill. At the end he complained he'd only been paid three pounds a yard a picture, while Rubens had been paid 10 pounds a yard for painting the banqueting hall in Whitehall. Some people come to see the hall chiefly because Nelson's body lay there after Trafalgar. He's probably the most immortal hero in our history. When they buried him, his sailors broke ranks and tore up the flag on his coffin so that each should keep a fragment. We were with him and he'll still be with us in his flag. Battle flags. Strange how we're always moved when we see the colors hanging tattered in a cathedral or guarded by a staced young ensign to whom they are his life and more or in the old days, dipping at the head of a final charge. The trooping of the color. It's no wonder that in all countries and in all ages, soldiers are fashioned for their colors and their safekeeping, patterns of ceremony. Trooping the color is a salute to the flag in the presence of the king, the two ultimate loyalties of the soldier. On the first occasion, it was a surprise birthday present for George II, but it has become much more.
I knew how all this intricate pattern of ceremony had been elaborated, and what it all meant. I'd come, like everybody else, to see it each year. The straight wheeling lines of soldiers, the great ones in their stands, the people round the parade ground, were all caught up in it, part of some ritual and service. I suppose we're all hungry for pageantry in a drab and formless world of utility. Our ancestors knew its magic when grandees thought it part of their duty to look grand. Behind their grandness was the remembered ritual of chivalry. The crown of all is the ceremony on St. George's Day of the most noble order of the Garter, whose knights have their chapel at Windsor Castle. It's the oldest order of chivalry in the world, dating from Edward III. The king had a kind of club with his companions, who fought together in tournaments. I shouldn't think it was possible to buy your way into a club of that sort. But its meaning deepened, and for a couple of centuries, it has been the highest honor the king can give. Above their stalls hang the banners of the knights in splendid dignity. But it is the blue garter that has made the order famous. There's rather an odd story of its origin. I remember reading somewhere in an old book, the garter of Joan Countess of Salisbury dropping casually off as she danced in a solemn ball. King Edward, stooping, took it up from the ground, whereupon some of the nobles smiling as at an amorous action, and he, observing their sportive humor, turned it off with a reply in French. On y soit qui mal y pense. Evil be to him who evil thinks. Henry VI lies in St. George's Chapel, and his statue stands in the quadrangle of Eton, which he founded on the other side of the river. I wish one could think of Eton without those tiresome photographs of social events connected with the school. But uh, I don't wear the right tie. It's a great school, much greater than ever the photographers have shown it. And the role of names of those who have done service to England is tremendous. But that doesn't prevent them from doing things that seem to outsiders rather funny, like a procession of boats with its fancy dress uniforms. Rowing was not always a manly or gentlemanly pastime, but now we've been taught to swing, swing together with our bodies between our knees. Not so many people row, yet one race brings a good slice of London's population to the river each year. You're either Oxford or Cambridge, almost from birth. And by goodness knows what reason of choice. I wonder if anyone has ever changed their first allegiance. For 20 minutes, all other life is suspended. Nature holds her breath, and the BBC intones, in, out, in, out. dies, the crowds depart and the river is alone. But the our contemporary life, which seems so permanent, will children one day sing songs about them too?
Battersea power stations falling down? Or will it become an ancient monument where Londoners can watch the quaint ceremony of the blue-trousered engineer pulling the switch? Of course, young and the Thames was old, and this is the tale the river told. I walk my beat before London town, five hours up and seven down. Up I go till I end my run at Tide End Town, which is Teddington. Down I come with the mud in my hands and plaster it over the Maplin sands. I remember the bat-winged lizard birds, the age of ice, and the mammoth herds and the giant tigers that stalked them down through Regent's Park into Camden Town. And I remember, like yesterday, the earliest cockney who came my way, when he pushed through the forest that lined the strand with paint on his face and a club in his hand. He was deaf to feather and fin and fur. He trapped my beavers at Westminster. He netted my sand.